We are currently in the Augustana Teaching Museum of Art, looking at Berger Sanzen's 1930 uh, Lake at Twilight. I'm here with renowned specialist, um, <laughs> Cora Lamb, and I am Taya Gonzalez, and we're going to have a great time talking about the analysis of this beautiful work of art. What I really like about this painting in particular, and a lot of his paintings, is this use of impasto. So he like thickly lays on the paint um, in like strokes with a palette knife, mm -hmm. and it really gives like a sense of movement to an otherwise still landscape. Um, and like seeing other artists in the uh, like before who, who aren't Sanzen, usually like people use this measure of painting if they're painting like figures or maybe be a figure in a landscape but you never really like you don't see it very often with just the landscape mm -hmm. he was coming uh, as a swedish immigrant mm -hmm. um uh, to kansas kansas of all places in the um early 1900s and he really just fell in love with yeah. um i think it's lindsborg uh kansas he actually he sent a letter in to uh the president of this college and he was like do you need any help and the president was like sure so at 23 he came over after um working in the academies in europe and just fell completely in love with this landscape um and i, th I think you can see that um in the way that he takes care to try and capture the specific lighting and and the colors and it's a very controlled composition and you can definitely tell that it's um the location that he's in really influenced his colors yeah. um because like he uses a lot of bright pastel colors in his paintings especially this one in particular um and the way these colors work is that they like move your your eyes across the painting like you first see the trees because mm -hmm. they're darker and um, darker in saturation than the rest of the painting um but then like because of all the contrasting colors like the green contrasts with the purple and then you see the sky and then you see the pinks because it kind of fades into it and mm -hmm. then you see the yellow mm -hmm. at the bottom and it just kind of really is balanced because of all the contrast to it. I think that was a really cool observation too that it's not necessarily symmetrical because um, of the way that Asanzen angles it out so it's like an ob oblique um, mm -hmm. angle almost um, but that there is this sort of balance because of the triangle we noticed a triangle when we were looking at it earlier between um, the pinks of the rocks uh, on either side of the trees um, and then uh, at the top in the like, clouds. Yeah, at the top of the clouds. Yeah, so it's really bringing your focus down in a kind of stable way to the greens of this um, group of trees. Yeah, and then the fact that there are three trees and mm -hmm. not just like two or one, like a lot of art, like art looks really good in threes, mm. I've noticed. Like three is like kind of a magical number. You see mm. a lot of triangles in art, so yeah. it just makes everything more balanced. It's really funny because you were, not you were noting earlier that um, artists who came before him didn't necessarily um, use palette knives to to paint landscapes. They, it was usually um, for figures, and so I think here he's joining the the American love of um, focusing on the landscape and like this is how we distinguish ourselves from from old Europe. Like this is our land, and so a lot of that is focused in on the trees. I remember reading somewhere that there was a specific thesis that uh, Sanzen had for his trees and. He was a deeply spiritual person because his father was um, a minister, um, a Lutheran minister. And so a lot of it I've um, read has been about the trees kind of having their own character and reaching oh, yeah. up toward the heavens. Um, I remember last time we were in the museum and we almost got into an argument with another group because they, they said they could distinctly see that each set of trees had some sort of different personality, mm -hmm. even if they weren't, this, even if they were the, of the same species. Um, and they almost they're like they're like reaching up they're, it's, they're not in any static position and and even if they were to be straight on which Sansa never does it's always at an angle mm -hmm. um the branches are always um reaching up and, and twisting in this sort of um acrobatic way up toward the heavens it's also almost sublime the way that he uses the trees to establish mood and and set a tone for the piece mm -hmm. um if you look at, there's a, a piece that's right next to it, and it's, I think it's Rise at Moon Creek, or, or 
Moonrise at the Creek or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems to be the exact same scene, but from a different angle and... Different lighting. Yeah, different lighting. Yeah, Twilight, I think, happens at, like, in the middle of the night, and but the moon is so bright um, where it actually looks like daytime. Yeah. I think it's, like, a phenomenon right. that that happens in. And you can kind of see that when we compare these two paintings, um, how bright like at twilight is in comparison and they both have like very bold vivid colors Mm -hmm. but this one is made more pastel well those are a little bit more saturated and a little bit more deep and rich right um he had this special love for colors i think somebody um i remember reading somebody asked him once why are you using purples and um like strange pinks and greens in your landscapes like they're supposed to look like landscapes um and he said well nature is not afraid to use those colors so why should i be which is kind of funny that we have this nordic man who comes from a deep scandinavian <laughs> culture yeah. of, um like landscape painting and we looked at um view from harlem grounds the mm-hmm. the bleaching grounds and it's very like kind of stark and atmospheric you yeah. know um but he accordingly said that the the colors were much bolder and more saturated and and, and more vibrant in the United States because the air was thinner. I don't know the scientific backing behind that, but um, I do know that he he really felt like it was his calling to try and capture all of that um, vibrancy by using these these really um, friendly colors, you know, Mm -hmm. really bold colors. Yeah, and you can tell, like, even though this painting is very well illuminated, the way he uses the light and shadow is pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Cause like, even though like it, it's pretty pretty illuminating, but you can see from where the moon is shining onto the cliff here at the uh, side, but there's bright yellows, yeah. and then in the grooves there's like deep purples. Right. And so you can tell like there's texture there, even though nothing is really detailed because of the impasto. Mm-hmm. Um, you can tell like what's being shined light on what's like a deep crevice right um so that kind of led us to believe um that this is a piece that uh, it sort of has an argument that nature is never still if you look at Assange and he was um influenced by impressionistic work his uh teacher used to share a studio with George Seurat but um he he almost he chooses these scenes where it looks as if everything is still um out in nature but then you you realize that there's an entire ecosystem at work here and it's it's as if he's taking care to note all of the different um, movements in the trees and in the light and in the shadows and and the um even in the crags and the water and the clouds he is pay- he's, he's taking very very special care of all of those details um mm-hmm. of american landscape yeah it's very serene looking but at the same time like not calm yeah because Um, of the texture there's just so much texture it doesn't you could tell that it's not just still and you know what looking at this i've only been to kansas once before in my life but i think after after sansan i'm a little bit more in love with it 